what do we do in the future and what does this mean in the future and the future that we want to be part of, that we see in 2030 we want Electrolux to exist, but where will the consumers be at that time and how do we ensure that we are kind of meeting their needs and driving the, the, the change that, that we see that needs to happen, that we all need to be part of. Welcome back to Heja Framtiden, the Swedish podcast on the future. My name is Christian von Essen. I'm recording from my studio in Stockholm, Roslagsgatan. I'm sitting here with Vanessa Butani. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Head of Sustainability, uh, Vice President at uh, Electrolux. Is that a correct way to describe it? Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good, yeah. And you you uh, have been working at uh, the company in many different roles over the years. So we'll get into that, I think. Well, let's dive into that directly, actually. Um, your background, you've been working with a lot of different stuff uh, over the years. Uh, tell us where it all started. Sure. Um, I'm Canadian, actually. So I grew up in Canada, but I have a Swedish mom. So I spent a lot of time in Sweden when I was growing up and um, started working in strategy consulting in Toronto um, with Accenture. Um, and I chose Accenture because I knew they had such a broad international reach. So I really wanted to take advantage of that. So after a few years of working at Accenture, I decided, well, now it's time for me to move. And then I really thought, you know what, I want to try Sweden. So I contacted the office here. I moved over here. And uh, I was working in strategy, right? And at that time, we were just starting to talk about, you know, corporate social responsibility, corporate citizenship. So I started learning and understanding about that and realizing the strong role that business has to play to really drive a change. And I thought this was really exciting. So I really wanted to get more into that. Um, I had worked at Electrolux as a client and uh, was looking at a strategy role with them. Mm -hmm. And um, basically I came in and I said, you know, I, I see the fantastic work that Electrolux has done with uh, sustainability for many years. I think we have an opportunity to do even more, um, integrating sustainability really into our strategy, really raising um, raising the bar and, and being more loud about it, telling people about it more. Mm. So um, I ended up coming in then in a strategy role with a focus towards sustainability. And from day one, I was really trying to get closer to the sustainability department and, and work with them and bring them into the strategy. And then after that, I ended up moving into the sustainability department, uh, which was sort of a dream come true at that time. Um, and so I worked with our sustainability group on our whole setting up of our new sustainability platform, doing the whole materiality analysis behind that, um, talking to different stakeholders, um, our leadership teams across the world about what was important for Electrolux, where can we really make an impact? And that landed us in our For the Better 2030 platform, which we have today, um, which we where we look at, um, from our company perspective, how can we be a better company? That's the first pillar. Uh, looking at ourselves, cleaning up our own house, working with our own operations, uh, ensuring that we have a diverse and, and equitable uh, workforce, and that we have the same requirements on our suppliers as we have on ourselves. Um, the other part is what we call better solutions, which is all about our own products and how we can uh, make those more energy resource efficient, how we look to make them more circular, uh, be part of a, a circular economy, as well as reduce the chemicals within those products. And then better living, our solutions sort of goes hand in hand with, with better living, which is the third pillar. And better living is all about how we can help our consumers live more sustainable lives um, to reduce the impact we have. Because we know about 85% of the of our carbon impact, our, our emissions, comes from the use phase of our products, right? So when they are in people's homes every single day, um, and you interact with them all the time, right? So we need to make better products that use efficiency. We also need to help people to use them in the best way, um, to, to sort of break their, their, their everyday habits, to use them in a different way, in a better way, mm. so that we can reduce the, the, or improve the energy efficiency, really, and the impact. Uh, going back to your <laughs> career route, you took, yeah, a, sorry. You, you, took, you, you took a detour as well. You worked at I did uh, take Scandic, a detour. Exactly. for example, the hotel chain yeah. in Scandinavia. I received a call from from Scandic in the middle there um, at Electrolux, and um, 
I wasn't looking for something else, but uh, Scandic's story really resonated with me. The uh, purpose of the company, also the sustainability leadership they had shown for such a long time. So it was a, a great opportunity for me to take to, to get to know Scandic, get to know a whole different industry, um, a really great company, um, and and also sort of test my own wings um, wow. of leading this all myself, which was great. But I always kept in touch with Electrolux because I had such respect for all my colleagues at Electrolux, particularly within sustainability, um, and um, ended up starting a conversation again about, well, maybe coming back and and uh, helping to take the next step in sustainability. So that's where how I ended up coming back to Electrolux, so, like a boomerang. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so now you actually lead the global sustainability. That's team. right. Yeah. That's that's amazing. It's um, <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun, mm. and as I said, it, the team is amazing. Um, I like to say we have 50,000 people on our sustainability team because this is really about the whole company being committed to this. Like I said, we've been working on this for ages. Uh, we have a sustainable strategy. We don't have a separate sustainability strategy, something we do on the side, something that, you know, if we change our minds, we can take it away. No, this is now really integrated in what we do and really an important part of what we do and how we see our business is going to thrive going forward. So super important and uh, since you've been working with this for a long time um, you 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 mentioned it just now that uh, there are so many different aspects to take into consideration like chemical use uh, refrigeration uh, sourcing of materials uh, workers uh, rights everything is the sustainability managers job becoming increasingly complex would you say Yes, I think it is. Um, and I think what I see is really the important thing in the in the sustainability manager's job is creating this network. So it's not just about me, right? Like you said, I can't do all of those things. However, I need to prov- show the leadership. So where it is we're going, what what is important together with everybody and then really ensure that that knowledge is out in the organization that sort of we're we're driving the strategy through the organization but also sort of having the tentacles out in the organization to get the 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 understanding of what's happening and bringing the feedback back in from the the regions from the local areas from the different product lines to understand what's important what's changing what's happening so that we can adjust and make sure uh we're moving Hmm. so to me it's really this network that you need to build um to make this happen and uh, you mentioned that Electrolux has been uh, on this path for quite some time. Uh, has the company done a sustainable transformation in a way, or was it part of the DNA already from the beginning? I think it's been part of the DNA for a very long time. I know there are examples from the past of, of I think, uh, some environmental organizations coming in, dumping refrigerators in the parking lot at the at the factories to highlight the you know greenhouse gas emissions and the the ozone, right? So I think there's been some awakenings like that along the way. But I think Electrolux has always worked with this topic because we see the the advantage and i mean for a long time we've seen how consumers are interested in this but i think we 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 come back to this fact that sort of we're you know we're in consumers homes every day we can make an impact and we can look at what we can do today but we also need to look at like what do we do in the future and what does this mean in the future and the future that we want to be part of that we see in 2030 we want electrolytes to exist but where will the consumers be at that time and how do we ensure that we are kind of meeting their needs and driving the the, the change that, that we see that needs to happen, that we all need to be part of. Hmm. And, and now you're one of the first companies in the world, I think, that is uh, aligned with the, the science-based targets. Can you um, expand a bit up on that? W- what is exactly the science-based targets? Because it's something, it's a phrase that is often used, but no one really knows what it means. Uh, so what does it mean for you? I guess if I put it simply, the science-based targets is a way of aligning yourself to the Paris agenda, right? To make sure that we keep, we do our bit to keep global warming uh, to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, right? So what the science-based targets does is kind of gives you a seal of approval that, yeah, the targets that you're setting, you're ambitious enough, you are trying, you are contributing to make that not happen, if we say. Mm. Um, so 
Yeah, we were one of the first companies to submit a target. Then you you submit that to the science based target admi- initiative, and they review it and they say they sort of give you a green light or a red light, right? If that's okay. if that's a good target or not, if they think it's ambitious and if it reaches their criteria of what what we need to to keep our emissions down to, right? So we did that back in two thousand eighteen. And uh, yeah, I mean, that was very new also for, for obviously many of the, many companies in the world, but for us too. And we didn't really know how we were going to get there. Uh, but we've been working really hard um, to achieve those targets. And actually this year for 2022, we achieved the targets three years ahead of our, our own plan. Um, and I think, yeah, you may say, well, you didn't know what you're doing. You said easy targets. But like I said, those are vetted by the science-based targets initiative. So you know that... Um, they're pushing us to to do our best. So hmm. um, we're really proud of the fact that we've gotten there. It's something that we are happy to celebrate. Um, and, and what kind of initiatives were in there? So we break it up into the different scopes of the emissions, right? So you have scope one and two, which is really about our own emissions. So that is coming back to kind of that better company pillar I was talking about, right? That hmm. looking at our own operations and how we can reduce our emissions there. So we've got a lot of programs in our own operations to make ourselves more energy efficient. Um, one big thing that we've done that's been really effective is our Green Spirit program. And that's multiple colleagues all over the world um, where we've set up this program um, to reduce en- our energy usage, right? And um, we have different levels in there that you can reach um, to encourage people. And it's a different factories. And it creates kind of a gamification, right, of like how great you can become um, in reducing emissions. And of course, it has a positive impact, right? Because when you reduce your energy usage, you're reducing your cost as well. So it's it's a win-win, which hmm. is which is really good. So some of the good things we've been doing there are, for example, moving, um, taking our forklifts and making those electrified, or putting uh, solar panels um, on many of the uh, many of the roofs in in our on our factories in different parts of the world, um, and also uh, moving to renewable energy. So we now are at ninety eight percent renewable energy across the world. The other part is the scope three, and that's also what I was talking about previously with the, about better solutions um, and better living, right? Our products in use. Um, and that one's harder, right? Because, of course, we can make the better products, but we need to make sure that, that we, we stimulate the demand for those too. Um, so there we had a target that we also managed to reach in advance to reduce our, our emissions from our products. And that's really working with the better technologies, improving those, spreading those further um, across the world and, and, and enticing people to, to want those. And we see that they're, they're very popular, right? Um, we've recently launched some products that have also um, received uh, IF awards, Red Dot awards. And I think that's really the strong proof of the fact that we have this sustainability part built into, you know, the brief of what is it we're trying to achieve. But at the same time, of course, it has to be a product that people want, that people like. So being able to combine the sustainability with the great design in people's homes, then it makes it more more desirable, obviously, mm. right? And you mentioned the the dumping of uh, freezers and refrigerators in the parking lot. Uh, how do you make sure that uh, these uh, appliances are taken care of in a sustainable way afterwards. I mean, can you recycle and reuse and rebuild? That's something that we're looking at a lot. And of course, the situation is different in different parts of the world. Um, in in uh, Brazil, we just launched last year a program where we take back appliances for consumers. So if you buy a new one, we will take back your old one for you. And that's mm. been super popular because we know in our research as well that People feel bad about not knowing where does the appliance end up, um, and and you know does it get taken care of? Perhaps in Sweden uh, you have more you know better recycling systems, but we don't have that everywhere in the world. In Europe we have the the WE system, the um, what is it waste electronics um, program, where we where there is a collection and and all of the producers are part of that and had to contribute to that. So that mm. is a much more working process. But that's why it's great that we can come together to set up programs like we've done in, in Brazil. Or for example, where we are in Singapore, um, we've launched um, a product as a service program called Levande. Levande. And um, there we're, we're testing out, uh, do people want to rent products? 
Yeah. Right. And in that case, you, you rent it and then you have the service for it uh, and we'll take it back at the end. Right. So that's another interesting model that really starts to change the way we're looking at how we uh, use our appliances, how we own our appliances and then what happens to them. Because once we get them back, we can look at refurbishing and, and giving them a new life. Right. Yeah. And I, I like that model because it puts the responsibility on the producer. <laughs> <laughs> It's like Electrolux is responsible for providing a uh, Uh, an appliance that really lives a long time if it's the other way around you may uh, design a product that breaks after five years and i will have to get a new one uh, but this sort of shifts the whole uh, dynamic of, of ownership i think Definitely. And I mean, we see that people are thinking about this more and like it. Again, it's different in different parts of the world, right? Mm. But one example I have also is, I mean, with um, recycled materials, right? And for us, like I said, usage and energy usage of the products is super important. That's where our impact comes. But as we get more energy efficient um, in our products and as the uh, society, as the grid gets more energy efficient, right? We move to more renewables in our town, cities and towns. Then the energy impact of the product decreases, right? And then the other parts, the other impacts become bigger. So for example, materials then is is the next um, the, the next impact factor. Uh, and for us, it's plastic and steel, which mm. we use a lot in our products, which really have the impact. So now, well, for a while also, we've been working a lot with, with, with those two products or those two materials to see how can we get more recycled materials and how can we reduce the impact from those materials. So we just launched a refrigerator with an inner liner made of recycled uh, plastic, 70% recycled plastic, which mm. then makes it... 13% of the volume of that fridge then is recycled plastic. Um, and that's super interesting because we've worked very much with um, recycled plastic in parts on the insides that you can't see, right? Because it's it's harder to make it uh, aesthetically pleasing, right? You can't get that pure, pure white as easily with um, recycled plastic that you're used to having in a fridge, right? So we've been working with different ways with our design team, right? How can we make this still a desirable, aesthetically pleasing fridge while using the better materials, right? Again, combining that sustainability um, and design. And so now we've done that and we have this fridge that we've launched. Uh, we're super proud of it. And we just won an award for it at the European Recycling Awards. Okay. Um, again, for design and, and sustainability mm. together. But uh, is the plastic still fossil-based? Does it need to be? Uh, I mean, are we still awaiting the big revolution in bioplastics? Yeah, I think we are. I mean, the challenge that we have is we're trying to close the loop, right? We're trying to get more of the recycled plastics in, but it's hard to get that quality grade that you need. So we're working with, for example, uh, recyclers. We work with Stena Recycling a lot um, to figure out how can we make it more recyclable? How can we get back better material? And can this plastic that they collect can that be uh, is that is a, can we have a more reliable enough quality grade that we can start using that better in our products right so we're seeing that again it's pockets because it really depends on the local area that recycler what you can get so yeah i think we are waiting for this sort of big revolution in the in the uh, in plastics bio based for sure we can look at as well um i think we we haven't seen as much of the again the quality that we need mm. Um, and my understanding is that, again, you have that f that that factor of the recycling of it. Can you do that with the bio-based mm. also and get it back, have that loop closing in the same way? Yeah, that's a, that's an irony. That's a, a challenge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you would say that the biggest challenge moving forward now in the 2020s is uh, basically uh, material sourcing and recycling and reuse. I think that is definitely a big challenge. Another challenge, and you kind of touched on it, is this behavior change challenge. Mm. And I know you said, yeah, I think it's great that we we take more responsibility as a producer ourselves. I have to also bring up the fact that, you know, we know that consumers want to live more sustainably, right? Uh, we know that it's like 50% of consumers saying, I want to be living more sustainably, but I can't. I don't really know how. It's too hard. Um, and also, when you look at, for example, the IPCC report, right, they have a whole section on behavior change and how we do need to change our behavior, right, to to be able to uh, have a, a sustainable society going forward. So I think another of the big challenges that we have is how do we make that behavior change more easy so that it's not just putting all the onus on the consumer, right, but like helping them do what they want to do and 
in ideal situations, you know, and having them not even notice that they're doing something exactly. that's better, right? That's what I think. When, that's where we need to go. Yeah. But if you have energy efficient appliances already, you can't mess it up, more or less. <laughs> well, I think if I look at it this way, there's some way you can, because you can have the you energy efficient. Think about your washing machine. Mm. If you're going to do the laundry, how much do you think about which program you're going to choose? Or do you just go for the same button that you always do? Be honest now. Yeah, I always choose uh, some sort of um, speed echo yeah. uh, program, one hour. Right. So we, I think you're an example of, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, but sorry, you, ha you have an example, or you are an example of uh, what we most of us do, right? We just choose the same program every single time. Hmm. Um, and we, if we talk specifically washing machines now, right? And we know that. And we all have habits that we've learned from our parents who learn from their parents, right? So it's really hard to update and to know what to do. What we need to try and, and help people see is like, you know, if you always choose that Cotton's 40 or something like that, it's perhaps not the best way even to take care of your clothes, right? Mm. So what we're trying to do is nudge people to see, okay, you know what? Turn the temperature down because first it's better for your clothes and second it's better for the environment. And really that's a win-win, right? We've done a very interesting study called the future of, of laundry that we've done now for the past three years where we're seeing, um, and that's done across 14,000 people in Europe. And there we're seeing um, how people are, are doing their laundry, um, that people are actually not doing it uh, cold enough, fast enough. But actually we saw this year a change in that, perhaps driven by the pandemic, perhaps driven by the, um, by the energy crisis that we've seen here in Europe, that people really are moving now more to turning down the temperature, probably driven by saving energy costs, right? But so yeah. there are things that we can do that can actually help people. We can show people, for example, you know, if your clothes are just a little bit, you know, they're not dirty, they're not, they're maybe a little wrinkled, you've worn them for a day. There's a steam program on your washing machine that you can, you can throw the clothes in there, run it on steam. It uses 90% less water uh -huh. and your clothes come out great. But most people don't know that. So we need to work harder to help to this nudge people into taking the time to, to or perhaps actually not taking the time, but to, to learning how. We've got to figure out how to make it not take time, right? Yeah, looking <laughs> forward to a machine learning sensor in, exactly. the, in the washing machine. Exactly. Are you sure that's dirty? <laughs> exactly. Um, that's actually the opportunity I see with the innovation with the appliances, yeah. right? Like we're, we're looking now, uh, we have uh, apps that go with, with our appliances, right? And um, we can connect the appliances um, and then you can start to uh, help people in a more in the right context, right? Okay, now you're about to use your your washing machine. Did what are you washing? Are you doing jeans? Maybe there's a jeans program that would be better to use actually. Mm. Um, and and so it's really interesting how we can actually take the next step. I think in sustainability with uh, a connected appliance, uh, using the technology, using the understanding that we can have through mass data collection to understand what are people actually doing, and how can we help them shift. I also think it's uh, difficult to know when is the time to buy a new appliance. Because, uh, I mean, if we talk about a fridge and a freezer, new models are way more uh, environment friendly and uh, energy efficient, uh, probably better in many ways. But is it always better to throw out the other two? Or should I actually keep those for a few years more? That um, I think that's a difficult question for many people. That's a that's a really good question um, because it's also hard to answer just off the bat like that because it really depends where you are, how old your appliance is, of course, uh, how much you're using it. Because you think about the fridge that you were, you use as an example, right? If your fridge or your freezer is standing in the in in the garage or something like that, you hardly ever open it, right? You open it once a week to get something frozen out of it or something like that. Then maybe it's fine to keep it there right but if it's the one that you're using every single day you know then we've really got to look at the energy usage the technology that we have in the fridge that can help you also keep the products the food inside better preserve it avoid more food waste hmm. um, that you're looking at so it, there's, a, there's a combination of factors that you need to look into but i think that's one of our challenges also is identifying what we call kind of the optimal lifetime right because of course we can repair a product but it's, at some point it's better to replace it. Mm. Um, but then, to your point, we got to make sure that we're also taking care of that product so that it does get recycled in a good way uh, or reused, um, sent somewhere else, depending on, again, the optimal lifetime. 
how do you view the uh, sort of balance between regulation and innovation? Do you welcome stronger policies and regulations from authorities and global entities to make your company improving all the time? Or could it be a hindrance in uh, innovation in a way, if you know, if you get what I mean? There's always this uh, this dance back and forth, yeah. I think. And I think in general, we'd say it's good, right? Because look at how far it's pushed us so far with mm. all the uh, energy labeling that we have on on the appliances, right? And how that has been expanding. Um, and it really pushes us and shows what's important, right? I mean, we as Electrolife have been part of this for a long time as well in, in, in pushing for regulation. But I think the important thing there is to do it, uh, at least in consultation, right, um, with the manufacturers. Because sometimes you don't see, or, or with, I guess, companies in general, you don't, we don't see the impacts always of going a certain way or another way. And um, what we're trying to incentivize doesn't really work. But in general, I mean, yeah, I just really take the, the energies labeling as a great example of how that's really pushed the industry. And another uh, balance, I would say, is uh, what you uh, referred to earlier as you need to communicate and get the word out, uh, the kind of work that you do with sustainability. And then you might get accused of greenwashing because yeah. you're not sustainable in other ways. And then companies might resort to green hushing instead. They don't want to talk about their sustainability efforts because they're afraid of being labeled as greenwashing. How do you view that balance? I think that that one is really tricky. But I think it's also good that we, it's a, we're being forced to have those conversations. We're being forced to really think about what we're what we're communicating um, and how we're communicating, and be really science based, right, all the time. Make sure that we can back up what we're saying with the with the science that we've we've done. I mean, we do. We have so much. We have such great teams, right, doing the research, doing the uh, life cycle analyses and stuff like that, so that we can get to uh, real claims. For example, now we had we had our Electrolux Awards um, award ceremony last week, and um, one of the finalists was the team that has been working for at least a year and a half with food waste, uh, with the refrigerators, and figuring out the technologies that we can have to make food last longer in your fridge, and really understanding, are we actually making a difference? And, you know, getting the facts uh, that we are improving or extending the life of food uh, with the technologies that we have. So we need to be doing those things so that we're fully on our feet. But yeah, I think, you know, we have we have to be careful, but we can't be just hushing, like you said, and just like hiding, because then we won't move forward. Um, and that's what we we really need to do. But I think we need to, what I see as part of our role is making sure that I reach out to all of our colleagues um, so that people understand how we talk about things mm. so that we don't just, because everyone's excited, right? And everyone's proud of what we're doing. So you want to talk about it. And of course, we're encouraging that we should talk about it, but we have to be, sorry, but so careful in the way we say things um, and what exactly we say. And uh, that takes working closely with our R&D teams, with our communications, our marketing teams, but also our legal teams, actually, um, mm. to make sure that we're within the boundaries. Yeah, because it seems like sustainability in advertising has actually dropped uh, the, the past years. I don't know if it's because consumers <laughs> are not that interested or if it's because brands don't want to put their neck out. <laughs> yeah. Or if it's, if it's uh, tougher uh, economic times that uh, sustainability advertising is not a uh, top priority. Yeah, um, I think perhaps part of all of the above. Yeah. I think there's a general also sort of confusion, especially when you look at, I mean, I actually go back to my time at Scandic when we were talking about the Nordic Swan eco label, right, a lot. And um, how such a, how that's such a, a strong symbol or this like uh, organic food symbols, but there's so many and they all mean something different. So how are you supposed to differentiate, right? It's hard. Mm. That's why I guess we're kind of lucky, uh, at least in Europe with the, with the appliances, that the energy label is the energy label. There's nothing else, you know. Mm. It's very difficult, especially in the, in the food sector, I suppose. Yeah. For consumers to know, what am I choosing? Yeah. What does a swan mean? Yeah. Because uh, that's a binary uh, label, right? You either have it or you don't. That's a, what's it called? Nickel wallet. The keyhole, I yeah, guess. Yeah, the keyhole. Yeah. But that's just for lower fat and uh, lower uh, amounts of salt, stuff like that. 
And then, but is it organic? Do you, does it have an organic label? Okay, what does that mean? Is it fair trade? Okay, what does that mean? So it's very um, difficult. And I think that's where increased uh, transparency and uh, traceability and yeah. use of the data and AI yeah. can really help. Yeah. And uh, I suppose that will enter the world of uh, appliances as well. Definitely. You can actually yeah. compare one fridge with another easily. Yeah, there is, um, I mean, as I said, we have the energy labeling, right? But that only covers energy. Yeah. And we need to think broader than that, right? But there's definitely legislation looking at sort of traceability with an appliance understanding, you know, where does it come from? Where has it been? Like, what has its life been? Where, how much has it been? Um, you know, which parts have been replaced or how much has oh. it been repaired and things like that. So that kind of legislation is coming. The challenge I always see with that is, is for one, keeping that data, I mean, in getting that data, but also making sure that we're all doing it in the same way so that it really is comparable, right? And how, who's going to check that? Yeah. Uh, to, exactly. Yeah. And, and make sure that we're all, we're all there. Uh, I mean, but the energy labeling builds on our own, our own kind of stamp of honor saying, yes, we have, we certify that this is according to the, to, to that level of energy, right? So yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots that we can do there. Can you tell us just a bit about what your supply chain looks like? Because it's going to be uh, global and complex, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have a huge supply chain um, because if you think about, I mean, for one, we have regional production. So we have tri local suppliers, but then also we have, you know, our products in, in many cases are very global. So we, we try to find the, the best types of, of supplies that we can, uh, that we can move around the world. Um, it's everything from the components, you know, the motors in the products to like the plastic, as I was telling you, to all kinds of little bits. And then there's the packaging as well. And then we oh. also source a lot of products um, uh, as OEM also. Uh, so so there's, there's all kinds of things like that too. What is OEM? Uh, original equipment manufacturer. So we buy a finished product basically and put our own name on it. Mm. So then we work with another manufacturer and give the specifications that we would like to have in the product uh, because we want to sell it, but they actually manufacture it for us. So it kind of depends which way is most efficient for us uh, to do it. But we work a lot with our suppliers. We have a responsible sourcing program, um, which uh, where we look at all of our suppliers. Uh, we go, we audit our suppliers um, based on our own code of conduct. So like you do saying, it yourselves? Yeah, we do it ourselves okay. to go out and look at, at and, and understand how they're working very much from a ethics, human rights perspective, to understand that from a social perspective, they are meeting the requirements that we have. And then, of course, we have all the requirements on the quality, on the how the product is produced and, and things like that. So. Mm. We work with our responsible sourcing program. We've also actually recently been encouraging all of our suppliers to join the CDP uh, to report their emissions through CDP. And CDP is another external agency that um, where we report our carbon emissions and that then ranks us basically or gives us a score on how good we are at reducing our carbon emissions. So we are strong there, but they now also have a program for our suppliers where our suppliers can report their emissions and then we try to work with them on explaining why is this important, you know, what have we learned that we can teach them about how they can reduce their emissions because ultimately, of course, their emissions become our emissions mm. when we uh, sell or use their 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 parts or their products. So that's like also that. scope three. That is on scope three, yes, yeah. exactly. Which is usually the most complex uh, uh, challenge to, yeah. to overcome. You know, we've set a target that by 2050, we're going to be carbon neutral at net zero throughout our uh, supply chain. So that means all our own products, but of course, then all of our suppliers also need to get there. So that's why we're working on these things, both from the social perspective with our responsible sourcing program, but also through the CDP program, helping them to reduce their emissions also. Oh. So how is that physically possible is do you work with carbon removal uh, stuff like that with our own operations we look at our own processes and where we have emissions in our own processes and we are working to improve those processes change those processes basically electrify we've done a lot as i said to date uh, we have big things left being you know when you put the enamel inside an oven right that's a very energy uh, thirsty process or painting the steel is also very um, energy intensive also heating all of our buildings mm. but we have said we, we're not going to be offsetting our emissions we are going to address the actual process and make sure that we change that so that that we get that 
uh, emission free. And then, as I said, working with our suppliers, um, we have supplier development programs where we also encourage, show, help, teach them either what we've done or other things that we can do that they can also change their processes. Could it be that you actually go in to a supplier and say, we need to ramp up renewable energy production? We will provide you with solar panels here on this factory? I don't know if we've done that, but that could certainly be something that we would discuss, right? Yeah. Like, how can we do that in partnership? Because if it's a win-win, then that's great, right? Because mm. you can understand, since we have so many different kinds of suppliers, they're all, you know, everything from suppliers that almost are bigger than us to ones that are almost, you know, very tiny. Um, so it's it's always a looking at the current situation and, and what can they do um, and how can we work with them. Have you seen uh, during your years in this field uh, the shift from sustainability as something nice to have and it's basically a cost and it's a bit annoying <laughs> to actually being core of the business model and and adding value? Yeah, I think I'll put it this way. I would say it's never been... It's always a challenge, right? But it's never been something that we've seen like, oh, we don't want to do this because we do believe, like I said, we've been doing this forever. But I think perhaps the motivation or the the focus of doing it has shifted. So maybe from the beginning, much came from cost, right? Like reducing the cost of the energy and, and things that we can do to be really efficient. That was great for the business and great for the environment, right? Where now we're really seeing, like I said, some of these processes that we need to fix need us to invest much more and and we're planning for those investments and how we do that over time to be able to get to our targets but also we see the demands from our customers i mean we get questions all the time both from our you know retailer customers who we sell through also from the investors uh, about what are you doing about sustainability right so we're we have this external pressure on us so that uh, actually makes it helps right that for us to to make those sustainable choices and push it even more when when there's such a demand out there for it. So I think it's more um, whether we wanted to or not. We've always wanted to, but it's it's what have we addressed in, in which order kind of thing. And do you see this shift not only in Electrolux, but in general? In yeah, I think so. Um, this as well. I think it's, you know, obviously there's some companies have been doing this for longer than others, uh, but, but I think we're all seeing uh, to some extent that the, the the world is changing and there's such a focus on this and sure i mean we can see in europe that the consumers perhaps want it more in in other parts of the world we don't see that demand as much but then other part like you know our retailers still are asking these questions right and for sure the investors and those are global investors asking us so um and i mean it's what we believe in and even and i think we see not even just with sustainability, but consumer trends, you know, might start here and then it ends up over there. So yeah. we know this is coming. We know that it, it's going to be good for us to be to be ready for this everywhere. That's why you can't really say anymore that uh, Sweden is so small. It doesn't matter what I do, uh, because look at China or Africa, uh, because everything matters, right? And if we get a viable business case or a consumer behavior change here it might actually spread for sure especially with the global company exactly exactly and i think it's good for us i mean we can test things in in certain markets and you can move them to other markets or you start here and then you develop it somewhere else you don't we we aren't necessarily reinventing the wheel every time right which we shouldn't and that's really the beauty of the global company hmm. um, but also i think what we get from working with partners and Stepping outside of our industry um, helps us also to learn. And I mean, you must have a broad variety of different initiatives across the globe. How do you keep track of those? And do you do you gather them in sort of sort of best practice database or something that you can actually reuse what they have learned there? In other parts? Absolutely. I mean, I think we recently actually made a big organizational change uh, to make our product lines much more global, right? So, mm. And I think that is part of that purpose, to really be able to have uh, global thinking uh, with our products. When it comes to sustainability, I mean, uh, we have programs that we've led for for a long time, right? So, And the purpose of that has been also identifying great things we can do in one place and then transferring it somewhere else, creating best practices, right, and sharing those. But it all builds on that network, right, and making sure that we are in touch, that we are sending but also receiving all the time in terms of uh, messaging and, and what's happening. Um, but, uh, I mean, 
like I was sharing the Green Spirit program, right? Part of that is creating a network so that people are talking about what are we doing? Oh, in this factory, we tried this. Oh, great. We can try that. How about this? You did over here, mm. right? So for sure, it's it, that's super important. But it also needs some uh, silo breaking uh, yeah. at the same yeah. time. Yeah, definitely. But I think that's also, I mean, I think it's always a challenge in a big company, right? But it's also having these kinds of programs where we encourage this, we try to, we try to, try to um, surmount those, those challenges also. And uh, what is the plan now for uh, these years leading up to 2030? What, what do you intend to do? So we actually have submitted um, a, a new science-based target. We haven't got anything approved, but uh, we're hoping for that. So we're pushing ourselves now to 2030 to get further. As I said, our target for our own operations is scope one and two to be at zero emissions. So we've got a very clear roadmap in terms of what we need to do, the investments that we need to make to get ourselves there. Um, and then when it comes to product use, um, we're still pushing for the energy efficiency, improved energy efficiency, and really addressing the materials um, now too going forward. Hmm. And do you have some kind of communication strategy as well? And as you said, nudging consumers to actually make changes as well? Absolutely. So we're looking, you know, we kind of look at the consumer journey from when they're sort of thinking about buying an appli new appliance to coming to us or coming to the retailer, they get it at home, um, how they use it, how they repair it, what happens at the end of life, and then they start to look for a new appliance, right? So throughout that consumer journey, we're mapping out, you know, where are the points where we can help to, yeah, nudge to a sustainable behavior, nudge to a repair rather than a replace necessarily, or looking at the different ways that we can uh, change the behavior. So that's work that we're mapping out. We're also really trying to get stronger in our communication, right, with looking at, like I said, being science-based, where can we actually make an impact? Where is the consumer in their mind? What do they think is important? How does that match? And doesn't always match, right? Uh, and then also for us as a brand, where do we want to be? So when you get those three things together, you kind of find that sweet spot of like, okay, we need to be clear about this thing that we want to communicate. Um, so that's the kind of thing where we're really pushing now to make sure that we can um, uh, reach consumers with the stronger messaging. But I think it's it, it, the nudging. One example I can give there with, with that work that we've done is the campaign that we had last year called uh, Break the Pattern where we're looking, um, kind of what we were talking about with the laundry, right? To help people, you know, change the way you're doing your laundry, change the way you look at your clothes to not just uh, wear them the average nine times that I think it is that we do uh, worldwide, but think about, okay, how can I take care of this better? Uh, how can I break the pattern, make my clothes last longer, which is better for me, better for the environment as well. Um, I usually ask my guests, uh, what is your best tip for making the world a better place in the future? I think my best tip, um, I would say, and I think that's for us companies, right, is to really understand this. We need to make behavior change easy. We need to find the ways of together helping to educate ourselves and the consumers to actually change the way that they're that the way that they are doing things we know that they want to we know that we have the right tools to do it we've got to get that message out and make it easier and i think here is really where uh, the digitalization the connectivity uh, is going to help us to do that um, but i think we have to find the ways really um, to do it in a way that the, obviously that the consumers wants and that the consumer in some ways won't notice so it just is better on its own for them mm. Great. Do uh, you have any good reading tips or podcast tips? I have two. I, I've been listening to the Circular Economy <clears throat> podcast by um, Catherine Wheatman, really, and she really deep dives into certain topics. So she was deep into plastics the other day that I thought was super interesting, understanding the whole world of plastics. And if you're looking for something fiction, I read um, Dreamland by Rosa rankin Gee uh, over my recent holiday. And it's sort of a dystopian look at a world maybe 20 or 30 years from now, right? So it's not too far off and just where we could end up both from an environmental perspective and a social perspective if we don't get our acts together. Mm. So it's a bit of a crazy book, but it was um, a good nudge <laughs> for me to to really to really um, find more energy in, in my work too and, mm. and, and keep going because that's not where we want to end up in that dreamland. <laughs> do, do you have a, a vision for your own uh, dreamland in a way? Can you imagine a future where everything has worked out, that we have made the right decisions? Yeah, I think I have to. That's because I want to. And I think that's going to be a combination of this mitigation, 
changing what we're doing, but also revolutionary technologies that are going to help us because I think we need a bit of both. But but yeah, I believe in that. Um, we, we're, I see that it's possible. Like I said, we, we, if we can reach our science-based targets, then we can reach the next ones as well. We just have to push ourselves to get there, and we have to. <laughs> yeah, and be better for all. Exactly. <laughs> um, who do you think I should interview? I think you could talk to Janina Hinala, who works at uh, Design in Electrolux. Uh, she was very instrumental in the work we did with this uh, recycled plastic, the inner liner made of recycled plastics. It was very interesting to hear how she worked with Consumer Insights and also finding the materials to, to make this happen. Hmm. Um, another person who I really enjoy talking to is uh, Kaisa Ritbay Valgrim from H2 Green Steel about the journey that we're on with steel and what they're trying to do um, to make hydrogen-based steel. Yeah, can you could you source uh, steel from them in the future? We would hope to, hmm. um, because, uh, like I said, we're looking at many different ways of, of reducing the impact of our of our materials, and hydrogen, obviously, is a, is a great way to do that with steel. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa Botani, for joining here from today. Thank you for having me. And uh, you can be found on LinkedIn, I guess. Absolutely. Electroluxgroup.com, uh, there you can find everything about the sustainability work. Absolutely. Great. Heaframpton.se for more information about this podcast and my other projects. My name is Kirsha von Essen. I'll uh, see you again next time with something different. Thank you so much for listening.